everyone. My name is Daniel Lermer. I'm uh, joined today with Mike McFreddy and Brandon Lovejoy. We are uh, here to discuss Eden and the latest developments that are going on to uh, do some answer some questions many people in the community may have. Uh, this is a free for flowing conversation. Um, the ideas in here are not necessarily fully developed, but we are conducting this uh, in place of AMAs so that we can get a little bit more structured uh, communication where we can go deep into certain issues, things that the Clarion development team is dealing with, recent events in the community and uh, things like that. So I would like to thank Mike and Brandon for joining me today. Uh, a quick overview of some of the topics that uh, we're going to discuss. I'm sure we're going to have more uh, coming up, but we're going to uh, you know, celebrate crossing 100 members for uh, the Eden community. Uh, we're going to talk about representation over time uh, and, and how that balances out the, the governance process. Uh, the other thing we want to talk about today is the registration process. How can we provide integrity to the registration process given uh, recent events where uh, certain standards were not uh, followed and the checks that were in place uh, were insufficient. Uh, and another topic that has come up is, well, what about the non-English speaking world? How can they get involved? I'm sure we will dive into many other topics as the conversation unfolds, uh, but that's sort of the introduction for this, this call today. Uh, so now we're gonna hand it off to uh, Mike to get started with uh, his uh, question. Yeah, um, why don't we start with the most uh, immediate issue? Uh, do you want to tell us, give us an overview of what happened with the induction process, um, the issue that represents, right, the, the breach of integrity uh, that that is, and then uh, some of the ideas we discussed about resolving that? Yes. So this past week, we noticed that uh, an account was created. Uh, uh, EOS USA, uh, which there's no malevolence as far as I can tell, but the cat was created using a um, image for their NFT that was not a, a portrait, which was the, the standard because these NFTs represent the people involved. They are part of our identity verification process. Um, and there were some other issues with the links. Now the signup process for Eden is supposed to have four different people checking things off. The, the new user is uh, going through and uploading their information. They're supposed to make sure everything's correct. And then the three other people that are witnessing them uh, and inviting them are supposed to be verifying the information. So when we have a situation where four people uh, all failed to catch a pretty obvious uh, mistake, that's a, opportunity for us to learn and investigate what happened. So if you haven't seen it, we did a 30 minute call with everyone involved this past week, it's on YouTube, uh, where we really dug into what each person uh, went through, uh, why they missed it, and, uh, and we came to a unanimous agreement on how to resolve it uh, in that particular case. But since then, uh, we've been uh, investigating the process and figuring out what things we can do to uh, incentivize the parties involved to take it seriously. All right, these are, there are four people that are relatively well known in the community. Uh, they had no ill intent dis despite the account name of e EOS USA being I break your shit. Yeah, uh, that is, uh, <laughs> just the account he happened to use. And so it looked really bad on the outside. Uh, as Eden grows from 100 people to 1,000 or 10,000 people, uh, all of a sudden, it's not going to be so easy to give everyone the benefit of the doubt because the community just starts to get too big. And yet, you still need to maintain integrity because verifying account profile information is just the lowest level of integrity, uh, of accountability, of verifying subjective information of being an oracle for the truth. And it's upon everyone's interest for the community that we can get these simple verifiable facts 
reliably entered into the blockchain to serve as the raw inputs into the broader consensus mechanism uh, so that people can trust it. Uh, we, let me put in one thing there. Could you say, just to make it very explicit, because I think this is deceptively, this is more important and deceptively seems small. Um, let, let's talk about the foundational importance of of civil resistance, right? What's what's interesting about this process being really tight when it comes to what that means about the overall Eden? Yeah, but well, Eden is supposed to be a process where people reach consensus on bylaws on how we're going to act as a group to accomplish something in the world. In this case, the you know Eden on EOS is trying to accomplish the adoption of EOS as a currency, the advancement of EOS IO and, and those things. Uh, and so we're trying to reach consensus on this process. And, if we, and part of that is we have to be able to reach consensus on very elementary things uh, like, hey, this is a real person uh, because we're expecting that real person to participate in the governance process. And if that gets corrupted and now we've got civil attacks, which is attacks by fake users or people who aren't doing their jobs, then the system starts to break down. Uh, the system loses its integrity. And if people can't trust trivially verifiable facts to be accurate, how can they trust the Eden community with managing tens of millions of dollars on behalf of the EOS network? Uh, so this is a matter of uh, proving the system works and we can hold the members accountable um, stated another way, uh, every single community in the cryptocurrency sphere is created largely by whoever wants to buy in. They've all got approximately the same DNA and there's no boundaries. Anyone can join any community and anyone can do anything at any time, which means these communities kind of self-select for, uh, I guess, the current Pareto distribution of wealth, uh, current corruption, uh, there's sort of a, if I can get away with it, it's legitimate attitude, a code of law attitude um, in the broader cryptocurrency community, which kind of makes everybody the same. All the different cryptocurrency communities have approximately the same DNA, uh, with the exception being if they're centralized enough that some central entity is censoring and defining the bounds of, of the community and guiding it. Uh, in a particular direction. Now, the EOS community is incredibly decentralized, right? You know, we kind of like would hope Block One would guide and lead EOS IO development, but Block One's largely been hands off so that the EOS community can be decentralized. But as a result, uh, the, the culture inside the EOS community uh, is not as strong as. Um, as it could be, because there's no means of reaching consensus, there's no means of acting together. Uh, we've just been joined by Brandon Fancher. He's a, a member of the Clarion team, responsible for a lot of the UI work we see on the Eden governance. Welcome, Brandon. Hey guys. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, so, getting the process to work at the most fundamental level of hey, we've got a thousand unique verifiable individuals with accurate profiles and everyone is adhering to the most basic subjective bylaws that they're posting. Uh, their profile is a photo that is representative of them, like you would recognize them. Uh, being able to show that we can act in unity in that and that all members are conforming to that and that we are not tolerating anyone to remain a part of the community uh, who's intentionally in, in violation of that is critical to demonstrating that an eating community is committed to the consensus process and is committed to follow that consensus because we recognize that we are stronger when we act together uh, in a coordinated fashion uh, and that by doing so that all the individual members benefit more than if they we're doing whatever they're going to do in an uncoordinated fashion. So it's really, really important that we get this right. Uh, now, Eden's been growing incredibly quickly. We've been getting the software out there uh, and we've kind of been growing. We're kind of a 
a, a root of trust and, and you know, trusting everyone to do the right thing. And uh, so far, there's only been honest mistakes as far as I'm aware. But uh, all communities need a good immune system because eventually somebody is going to do something intentionally malicious. Somebody is going to decide, you know what? I don't care what the community consensus is. I just want to cause trouble and I refuse to leave voluntarily um, <clears throat> and so forth. And so is that immune system, the ability of the community to reach consensus on, has somebody violated the rules? What are the consequences of them violating the rules? And how do we ask them to leave? And if they won't leave, how do we kick them out? In a way that doesn't devolve into, there's a some internal power structure and they kind of decide everything and, and uh, it gets captured by incumbents, right? <coughs> the, the purpose of Eden is to prevent incumbent advantage and to make sure that to the broadest extent possible, the direction the community goes represents or is representative of um, I guess the majority opinion, the, the, the collective opinion and the real collective opinion versus let's say a manufactured opinion or a false opinion, right? We see this with elections where they do polls and the polls say one thing, they're biased sampling and things like that. Uh, we've got rational ignorance, we got political party formation, we got all these different things that cause traditional democracies to decay into what I call democracy in name only, dinos. Um, and then they end up captured, you know, into some kind of ol oligarchy. And then once it's captured, then all the members have their energy and power and wealth sapped for the benefit of, of the few. And this no longer makes sense to be part of that group. Um, unfortunately in real life, it's not so easy to secede, but in crypto, what that looks like is people abandoning the community, right? And we've seen what happens with lots of people abandoning the EOS community because there's no funding. So we can't reach consensus uh, because you know, we're, we're looking to centralized organizations to provide leadership and the like. And so that's what we're up to with Eden is reaching that consensus. And we have to build the um, defense mechanisms, the, the immune system, if you will, for when bad actors eventually come in uh, and they need to be asked to leave. Um, and so, so for the first yeah, year, go ahead. Before, yeah. we, before we go into that, I, I wanna get one thing, you shared a thought with us that, that I, I found really valuable and it's more for the, the tech, it, it fits more of this community than the general community. But the idea of, you br we brought the idea of each representative being an oracle for the truth, right? You said that earlier, even in this call. And I wonder if you could say something about the integrity that we're used to on blockchain and bringing that kind of integrity and what it means to have an Oracle in that setting, how we're like kind of replicating that level of integrity. Uh, in yeah. yeah, so every user is an Oracle and blockchains are algorithms that are deterministically enforcing contracts and property rights and transferring titles to assets, tokens, NFTs, whatnot based upon uh, inputs provided by the user. In this case, the, some of the inputs are, are statements that are supposed to be truth. Are the unique person? Did you do this? Is this person in the video, right? So, you know, under the title tr transfer theory of contract, which is what I call smart contracts, which is the idea that all contracts and all property uh, is conditionally transferred from one person to the other based upon some evaluation of a fact. Is it true or false or some input? And the goal of a dispute resolution system uh, is to uh, provide those facts. And then the smart contract evaluates the rest. And as much as possible, we wanna get away from systems where the courts uh, and the, it's subjectively trying to apply damages, subjectively trying to interpret the intent, we want the courts to basically say, be an oracle, this is the truth. And so every single individual in the community is acting as an oracle when they're providing things. These were the people who were in my meeting. These were the votes that were cast. These are, you know, these are all oracle information that we're putting in there. And as Eden progresses, the more and more of the information is derived from 
other information, right? So, uh, you know, you start off with, this is the outcome of the election and oracles are reporting that. And then you say, oh, these were the votes and we're calculating the outcome based on the votes and so forth. Uh, and as the smart contract, the title transfer theory of contract um, evolves with Eden, uh, then more and more of the consensus will be determined, but it all starts, the root of all consensus is people reporting facts as oracles into the system. Uh, and the very first thing we're trying to reach consensus on is who are the members and what do they look like? And how do we contact them? What, what are their social profiles? That's what we're trying to reach consensus on right now. And if we can't reach consensus on who our members are, uh, we can't reach consensus on anything else. Um, and that is uh, why it's very, very important that we have incentives for everyone to do the right thing. So let's talk about some of the things that went wrong and uh, how we can resolve it. Uh, there's a little bit of ignorance, a little bit of, oh, I trust him, so I'm not gonna check it. And a little bit of, hey, I was the third guy and three other people already checked it, so I'm just gonna check it because the other three guys obviously didn't uh, you know, <laughs> screw things up, right? If they all checked it, then I'll check it, right? So it's just a, hey, someone else looked at it, and so I'm not going to do my job, my responsibility uh, to, um, to verify the information. Now think about what this means. As a member, you're participating in bringing in a new member. That new member is going to have vote weight, they're gonna have say, uh, it's going to impact the entire community. And so the community is trusting you to do a, a little bit of vetting, a little bit of verification on the onboarding of new users. That is a privilege because it's, a, it's a amplifying your say in the community because you're bringing in somebody else. Uh, and so, we, you should be expected to do a little bit of work. And people are already doing a little bit of work in, in terms of they're showing up for the videos and they're doing the induction ceremonies to, to verify that. So there's a little bit of work that people are doing. But you know, once again, people are kind of naturally lazy, trying to do as little work as possible to get through their life. That's just how people are. But this is a situation where as a community, the consensus needs to be that, hey, there's a responsibility associated with this role to honestly vet the information, make sure the community looks good. Because when the community looks good, the community is stronger and everyone in the community is stronger. When the community looks bad, then because we can't police ourselves, we can't, uh, the members aren't acting with integrity, then the entire community loses power uh, and it impacts all the users, uh, all, all, the, all the people that are coming together for this cause. So uh, we wanted to, introduce some ideas that we've come up with on how to enhance that. Uh, and, and so the first idea was, uh, hey, if, if a mistake is found after you've um, approved someone, there's gonna be some kind of fee or fine. And you know, we're currently thinking the fine should be similar to the new member fee. So it's like 10 EOS. So if you have three people on a call, uh, and all three of them miss something that is, um, you know, we reach consensus is obvious, right? Hey, there's not even a face in this logo or in this uh, profile picture. Then all three people should be fined 10 EOS that goes into the uh, treasury of, of the community and is used to reward the person who identified the problem in the first place, right? So now every single member of the community has financial incentive to look for uh, issues and when they find them to uh, to report it so they can get rewarded. Now, you know, game theory being what it is, everyone's going to try to report everyone just in case there might be an issue. Uh, and so in order to report something, you also have to, you should have to post uh, some EOS uh, so that if the consensus is wrong, or it, consensus, hey, actually, this was uh, not a mistake and you're making a false report that, that you can be uh, fined as well. Now, under the title transfer theory of contract, and you know, this was pointed out to me by Brandon, is we can't just fine people uh, and expect them to pay. Now, we can do that kind of thing and, and basically say, 
if you don't pay by a certain time, then you're out of the community. But it would be better to say, hey, you invite someone, you're going to post the EOS right up front in case anyone can challenge it. And then if no one challenges in 30 days, you get your EOS back. So that way there's always a 30 day window in time during which uh, you, there's funds available to pay the bounty to the person who identifies the problem. Um, so now we've created a system where when you're witnessing someone and you're participating in a video, you're going to lock up 10 EOs for a month on the integrity of what you're saying. And the act of having to lock up some money for 30 days um, should hopefully incentivize people to say, hey, I'm gonna make sure all this is right because if any of this is right, I'm losing this money. Uh, and it kind of adds a seriousness to it that um, is uh, easy to take for granted. Now, hopefully as things uh, unfold, lots of people have balances maintained within the community and it won't be a problem uh, you know, they're, they're just gonna be holding on to the EOS anyway. So um, that should be relatively simple. Dan, so, one, thing on, one thing on that topic, uh, I also found really interesting. If you, we talked about um, why not just, why don't I stake as an inviter, why don't I stake 10 EOS or 20 EOS to say, I'm going to invite people and I'm gonna stake my, you know, stake my invitations on this one chunk of money. I think it, it's valuable to walk through financially. Why are we staking 10? Why are we staking money per uh, per invitation? Yeah, under the title transfer theory of contract, uh, every asset can only be belonging to one person at a time. And so if there's a lien on a property, you can't put multiple liens on that same property because if one of them goes bad, then what's collateralizing the others? Um, and so this just gets down to title transfer theory of properties about not doing fractional reserve banking. It's about making sure that there's always assets available to make right um, whatever situation is uh, needs to be remedied according to the oracles, the people that are reporting what's going on. I would like to add a, um, uh, go a little bit further and discuss, well, let's say that, you know, I, I discover that there's somebody who's got a mistake in their profile. They're not adhering to the community standards. And I report it. All right, how do we judge it? Who is it reported to? This is a question Mike brought up earlier this week. Um, and he had some pretty good suggestions, which I'd like to uh, acknowledge him for here. And the suggestion was that it gets reported back to the original three witnesses and, and the user. And if they're all um, attempting to be good standing, standing members of the community, they'll acknowledge the fact, hey, you're right. I did screw up. I did fail to check this. And they would all reach consensus, yes. Uh, and then they would give their bond over the person and we could institute the process of fixing or correcting it. So this assumes that, hey, when a mistake's made, Everyone's going to own up to it. Um, the you know the bounty is still paid. The fines are still done, and everyone has reputation that hey, a mistake was pointed out to me, and I corrected it. That builds reputation, and the fine was paid. No harm, no foul. Uh, the only time we have a dispute is when uh, the the three original witnesses disagree with the person who claims that there is a mistake. Now we've got a situation where we actually need to have a jury of some kind resolve the dispute. Now we need all the parties to put even more money in so that we can compensate the jurors uh, and all the people that have to put more time in for the dispute. Uh, and so that the winner is incentivized to continue. Um, but anytime there's going to be a dispute and there's a claim, you either put up the money or you lose by default um, is, is sort of the way this uh, unfolds. Um, and that holds everyone accountable. So we're, gonna, we're gradually building this stuff into the code. Uh, we're going to start by get, allowing people to voluntarily resign and, and do other things. And we can do all these things offline in videos that are recorded and we can hash it on. 
onto the chain, but eventually we'll get more and more of this process automated as the bylaws are refined. Um, I'd like to like, expand on the concept of bylaws for a second. The bylaws include both the subjective rules that we all agree to follow and the source code. The code itself is part of the bylaws of the community. Um, and so we will be uh, updating the code so that eventually the elected um, representatives can change smart contract and it's no longer going to be governed by the Clarion team. Um, and so for the first year, you know, I'm in charge of all the bylaws, subjective, code-wise, whether the elected personnel are responsible for the money, but I'm in charge of the bylaws just so that we can establish something that works through all of these ideas without having to go through a, a big committee. Obviously, I'm taking lots of feedback from the community in the process. Um, but the idea is I'm going to guide this until we can get a, a, a working base model. And then the community can evolve it in whatever direction they want. And I will no longer have any say over the bylaws except as an advisor to the community or if I'm elected. Um, so that is the registration process, the importance of oracles, uh, some of the designs that we're looking at uh, and processes that we're looking at to add integrity to that. Uh, and we'll be doing that for other areas in the community when integrity is called for as well. Dan, uh, another topic I uh, hadn't thought to ask you, but it, it seems, seems like another tie-in, really valuable tie-in with the book. With the incentive structure we're talking about with um, induction meeting integrity, it seems the wealth versus power, you can leverage wealth to invite more people, for instance, but the integrity of those invitations is being enforced by, uh, at least potentially be enforced by people for whom the incentive of reporting is valuable, meaning people for whom that that reward is more valuable. And that that mm -hmm. seems really valuable that the, the leaves of the tree, as it were, have power to maintain the integrity of the system. Yeah, that's a really good observation, Mike. Thank you. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so let's talk about how the bylaws change uh, and how it... I, um, sorry, before, right. before we go into bylaws though, I, I do wanna bring up a few you know, questions and, and clarifications with what we just spoke about. Um, first of all, I wanted to make more concrete uh, the reason why we wouldn't allow someone to just post 10 EOS whenever they join, but be able to invite as many people as they want to without you know, posting another 10 EOS per invitation as the, as the stake or the bond. You mentioned fractional reserve and uh, the ability uh, for the smart contracts to transfer title as a consequence programmatically, right? Which is one of the core foundations of what you lay out in your book when it comes to the theory of contracts. You know, that versus saying, hey, I promise I will pay a 10 EOS fine if, you know, there is a problem here. The smart contract can't enforce that. But uh, the, the reason you're saying that someone couldn't just post a, a one-time 10 EOS bond is because someone could invite, you know, five or six people and get them in. Uh, and three of those profiles could have problems uh, before uh, anything is even flagged. And so where does the 10 EOS go to? Which, which uh, reporter does it go to? And it does just break down into a, a promissory based fractional, fractional reserve sort of system. So I, I wanted to take that, you know, you, you laid it out pretty well and a little bit more abstractly, but but more concretely, uh, you have to have a bond per per uh, uh, invitation. Um, and this is a, this is a thirty day bond. You have to re uh, you get it back within thirty days. Anyone who's reporting things has to report it within thirty days. Now, if something's found after thirty days, uh, you're still expected to pay the fine. Yeah. but it's no longer locked up and it is kind of a promissory thing. That's really more about to protect your reputation because if the community assesses a fine um, to you, 
uh, you're expected to pay it or resign from the community because you've basically said, I am no longer going to comply with the community consensus and, and now I'm, I'm out. The reason we have people do it up front is because, well, people get busy and we don't want to have people get kicked out just because they weren't paying attention, they didn't pay something and we don't want to have bill collectors trying to chase everyone around. Yeah. Uh, and we wanted to create an incentive to, um, you know, put some time boundaries around certain things. But yeah, the, at the end of the day, your membership in the community is the collateral uh, for your behavior. And the idea is that we should make, it should be valuable enough for everyone to want to stay into the community that they care about their reputation with the community. Uh, and the reputation within Eden, uh, in reality, should extend out beyond Eden so that, hey, you know, you leave Eden and you go to some other cryptocurrency project and say, hey, you didn't pay a, a fine here that's clearly documented why you owe it because there's videos recording all the proceedings and everything and you had agreed to it and you just resigned without paying. Uh, you know, that speaks a little bit of, to you, the... Uh, the character of the parties involved. So or you know, what you, uh, yeah. what you think is, you know, membership in Eden is worth, if it's not worth the 10 EOS, then you're probably not in it for the, the right, you know, reasons. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it's ability to acknowledge, Hey, I had a responsibility. The community was hurt because I didn't uphold my responsibility. I knew what the consequence would be for failing to do it. And, and I'm following through. So a big, a big principle that we're trying to go for, is make sure that the consequences of certain actions are laid out in advance. They're defined. You know what you can lose because you you posted the bond ahead of time. And it's not one of those things where you're joining a community and they're going to say, and now you owe us a million dollars because we don't like you. Can't do that, right? Because the consequences are laid out up front um, and, and you are bonded up front. Um, and that's that's all laid out in the chapter of my book about smart contracts and how um, you know, the damage theory of contracts is completely flawed. It's unsustainable and it causes all of society to be built on a foundation of sand, of musical chairs, fractional reserve. Yes, Brent, uh, Lovejoy. Yeah, I changed my name to Lovejoy so we can avoid any confusion. <laughs> um, so you've mentioned value and the value of belonging to Eden. Um, in this first instance, we're talking Eden on EOS. What do you see as the value of belonging to Eden and why, you know, because I feel like that's a question that comes up a lot in the community, especially as we're trying to find new members, like people often wonder what's in it for me? Like, why should I put my time into this? Um, perhaps mm -hmm. you could speak to that a little bit or anyone else too after obviously everyone's got different motivations and reasons to value being part of a community um, in this situation you know eden is a new governance model based on ideas of fractal democracy uh, as i discuss in my book uh, it's really designed to empower the individual right the idea is as individuals uh, we're kind of powerless against the machine <laughs> of society that's out there. But if you can get uh, two people together, well, they're more powerful than one, and it's, they're more powerful than two people that are not cooperating. Two people cooperating are more powerful. You get a thousand people together, and now they're more powerful. If they come together for the, for the purpose of maximizing the power and impact that the individuals have in the world, like that common purpose, then, uh, you can do more to achieve your personal objectives by aligning with a group that's aligned with the direction you want to go than by doing it out on your own. Uh, so that whether that's supporting some charity, whether that's seeing EOS be successful, or whether that's creating a new political party that's going to, uh, you know, elect the president of a country. Uh, whatever objective you're trying to do with other people with the goal is to empower the individual. Eden is a governance structure designed to empower the individual without, uh, at the end of the day, leaving the individual subject to a new power structure that leaves them powerless, right? Democracy can empower uh, some popular 
tyrant to control everyone. But once you get the, the popular individual into power, how much power does the individual have left to change the edicts of the tyrant that they put in there? And in this case, the tyrant might be doing things, you know, they might be benevolent, but uh, the people immediately lose power because they don't have the ability to reach new consensus. And so how can you reach consensus without giving up your power? Uh, and that's, that's what Eden's all about. Um, it's about discovering the leaders instead of the media telling us who the leaders are through, uh, through wisdom of the crowds and, and algorithm design. Um, and so why should you be involved? A, you get to experiment with this new process. You get to prove to the rest of humanity it works. B, the EOS community is likely to fund the Eden community with a lot of money, which means you're amplifying your own money. You put a dollar into Eden, EOS matches it with $20 or $10. And now collectively, you have a say over how $20 is spent for every $1 you put in. Uh, I don't know what the exact matching ratio is going to be, but you're gonna get a multiple return on your um, economic power. Um, now, it has to be aligned with the consensus of the group, but if you're aligned with the consensus of the group to change the world, to bring smart contracts and title transfer theory of property to uh, see EOS adopted as a currency, we're all aligned on that. That's why you wanna be part of Eden because it's more likely that we will be successful if you join us than if you continue doing whatever you're doing independently outside of the um, Eden community. Dan, I wonder if you could you could talk about something I, I've grappled with, and I, I think it's a really cool topic. Um, the we don't we don't know the amount of matching, so let's just put matching aside for a moment. Um, it's starting to dawn on me the more I think about this, the leverage that you get just just with your dues, just as you with your member dues, just the fact that so many people come together and put a small amount in so that they can achieve something bigger, kind of a domino or an ant kind of theory. Could you talk about that kind of amplification? Because I think that gets lost when we, we see the sparkle yeah. glitteriness of lots of uh, inflation money. <laughs> yes, so let's talk about eating communities that exist without subsidies from the US network. Why would you want to join a community? Why would you want to pay dues? And how much dues should you be willing to pay into a community? Well, imagine that you wanted a new calendar app. And it's going to have some, some features and, and so forth. And it doesn't exist anywhere. And you know there's 100 other people that also want this calendar app. Um, and let's, for the sake of simplicity, assume everyone's a programmer, right? Uh, but it's going to take an entire year to build this app. Does each person contribute one day to the cause? Uh, or do they pool their resources to pick one of them to write the app and then they all get to use it, right? It's, it's that pooling of resources that allows us to do something that you couldn't do alone. It's, um, if you have one brick, you can't do anything other than doorstop with it, right? It's not very valuable. Um, and, but if you have, thousands of bricks, you can build a house or a wall or, or something productive. So if you can get people to pull their bricks into a big enough pile that you can do something bigger, the value of the thing created, the wall, is greater than some of the value of a thousand doorstops, right? Um, and so the question is, well, if we pull our resources, then who gets to decide, do we build a wall or a house? <coughs> and, and where does the wall go and who gets to live in the house? Uh, those are all questions that need to be addressed by reaching consensus in order to motivate people to contribute the brick in the first place, right? Because they're giving up a doorstop. Um, and that's why you would want to come together because you are creating value, value from nothing. It's not a zero sum game. You're creating value by coming together. And if you can come together, create value, and then figure out how to share the value created. Every single person involved in the process uh, goes from having a doorstop, doorstop to having a fraction of a wall or a clubhouse or a, um, you know, whatever shared community resource. You say, yeah, I'd rather have 
a clubhouse where we can have parties and we can do things. And I'd rather have that than this brick for my doorstop. Uh, and so uh, it's, a, it's a net increase in value for everyone who's participating. And that is how we advance as a society. That's how we increase our wealth and our well being. Uh, and that's why it makes economic sense uh, to participate. Um, now, it requires having a broader view of value than just dollars and cents. There's value to be in community, there's value to the environment, there's value to um, um, all kinds of subjective, fuzzy things that you can't measure monetarily. Uh, and we live in a society that tries to measure everything monetarily as if that's the only measuring stick that matters. Um, but it's not the only measuring stick that matters. And the, you know, if we have a community of people that know that and we attempt to factor in these things, it's great. I mean, giving to charity and helping out your fellow man is something that provides value to the giver. Uh, as well as the receiver, or people wouldn't be given, right, in the first place. Pooling resources to give to a charity is doing some good in the world, and it's benefiting all the people who are giving because they get to see the world be better, even though their bank account might not be uh, bigger as a result of, of the gift. Um, and I believe that there's enough people out there that see the value in all these subjective things. They see the value in beauty. They see the value in cleanliness. They see the value in friendship and trust and all these things. And if we can create and build those things together, uh, then you know, that's very, very powerful. Um, you know, where I ultimately see this going is a mutual aid society where we can reach consensus on how to help uh, those who are in need uh, kind of like insurance, right? Oh, your house burned down. Okay, the community's got your back because you've been paying your dues on a regular basis. And we, can, we have the ability to reach consensus that you didn't burn down your own house or you didn't, you know, leave gas and sparks and going, right? You are not negligent and, and, uh, and so forth. Those are the, the things that we can reach consensus on as a community. Uh, and that's subjective. And, that actually provides a social safety net for everyone. That's how, that's where this evolves. Now, obviously Eden with, you know, a little over a hundred members today is not going to be able to achieve that goal in the short term, um, but we're proving the concept that will eventually allow local churches to adopt the Eden process, local co-ops to use this for, for farming situations, HOAs to use this, um, to govern disputes in the neighborhood. Uh, there's all kinds of applications for this process. And by being involved, uh, you get to learn about it. You get to promote it. You get to see these ideas advance in the world. And ben, let's even say, if- Let's stay on the, the topic of application. Cause I think, I think this is so again, deceptively simple. Um, we have to look toward we have to look to current day comparisons to really grapple with what's what's actually happening with fractal governance. And I think what comes to mind for me most is, you know, how do you get such coordination to happen? The the two primary ones, and I'm sure there are others I'm not thinking of, but if you want to see something change in your neighborhood, what do you do? You go door to door, right? Get a petition signed. And it's it's incredibly in, inefficient comparatively. I've got a I got to make a petition and then I've got to walk door to door or form a team to walk door to door. And if something about that petition, most people don't like, like it's just something off that maybe there's a consensus that could be formed if I got to discuss it, that's slightly different that everybody would sign. I get one shot to walk door to door in terms of my time, their willingness to open their door and talk to me. It's a very, very inefficient process. And I think the other one that comes to mind is form a nonprofit. I want to do this charitable thing. Why I want to form a nonprofit. What if I don't know how to run a company? That sounds like a lot of effort. Like it's a, it's a very high threat barrier to entry. And I think you could make really valuable comparisons between uh, the coordination opportunity of fractal governance and those two things that would be really, really helpful. Yeah, excellent examples. 
right? The idea is if you form a charity and it starts off with one thing, eventually charities get corrupt, right? And so people don't want to give to charities because insiders are taking high salaries and very little is going to the actual charity, right? Um, and that's just the nature of the challenge of reaching consensus and in a way that doesn't create a power structure that is eventually corrupted, right? <clears throat> you know, uh, you have the good old boys that work in your HOA, right? And so you get the same people in power all the time and then they use that power to pass whatever ordinances and control everyone in the neighborhood. Um, you know, that, that might not be the best way to go, but just effecting change. Hey, I wanna make a proposal, get something done. It's just not as effective to get things done if you need to coordinate a whole bunch of people and there's not a process in place to do it. Um, and so, uh, you know, the thing is, <clears throat> the, what Eden's com competing with is centralized organizations that have a strong leader and a vision uh, and everyone's kind of following that leader and, and they're highly skilled because they're in there to make money. So even if it's a church, what's the difference between a dying church that can barely pay to, you know, keep the building open and a church that's growing and has a great production value and all these other things. It's the pastor and the leadership team that are super skilled. Um, and how do you identify those people in a random group? Well, the thing that makes these businesses or even churches or charities successful or not is the fact that people have the ability to succeed and they can go somewhere else. Um, but where Eden really shines is where people don't have the ability to succeed because, hey, I'm stuck with you know your family members. I'm stuck with my neighborhood. There's things that are just more difficult to succeed from than others where consensus is needed. Um, you know, it's not easy to just bootstrap a new cryptocurrency or smart contract platform. It might make sense to try to reach consensus and make sure no one can take over the, um, the one and start using it for private gain, right? There's, there's a, a cost of switching. And so if you're going to build your business uh, uh, on a particular platform, you're going to live in a particular neighborhood. Uh, you're going to invest your time and energy getting to know people at a particular church. You might want some assurances that hey, if the leadership changes or gets corrupt, that you don't have to go somewhere else because you've got a lot of sunk cost and, and infrastructure. And so maybe join an organization that's governed in a way that, hey, if I know that everyone in this organization is generally aligned with me, then it's going to go in a good direction because we'll be able to do that. And then we're not gonna be subject to some leader that we are unable to reach consensus to, to change. Um, and so that's where this is a very powerful process um, and can be used uh, in all kinds of, of organizations where I guess there's a network effect of the members. Um, so social networks, right? Who's gonna censor content? How are we gonna moderate content? That's a great application for this consensus process um, because we all know that zero moderation leads to spam and abuse and there's a place no one actually wants to live because you can't control the bad actors without some kind of consensus that they're a bad actor and that they're harming the environment they're polluting the environment the rest of us are trying to engage in and that's sort of i see uh steam didn't work out as well as is it didn't have an effective way of reaching consensus on who the bad actors were and uh, policing it. And all the other systems out there all rely on some leader, some moder moderator, and uh, people might opt in and follow certain moderation groups and so forth, but that's just the old dictator leader structure and it's like accruing value to that leader and everyone was following because the cost of switching from one person to another is so high. Uh, and there's so much value that they've created by curating a certain set of content that next thing you know, you're, you got a new sensor who's kind of controlling your worldview uh, instead of being able to rely on the community as a whole to make sure that there's, your worldview is not being captured by individual interests. So there's a lot of applications to this process. Um, and I would like to see Eden evolve into a 
social network um, where there's sharing and posting and rewarding for producing content and in quality moderation. Uh, so while well, right now it's, you know, we're proving the concept, you're blazing the trail for new governance structure, you're potentially gonna have um, much more say over how funds and EOS are allocated. Um, eventually you're going to be the, some of the founding members of a new social, social network um, that facilitates consensus on quality content. Uh, and rewarding quality contributors. And that benefits both the readers and the producers. Uh, and it's gonna be really, really powerful. So that's what I'm excited about uh, and why this has value and why you wanna participate. You wanna get in early, get to know people, get involved and uh, build your, your reputation. Dan, we're coming up on an hour. I don't know how you're doing for time, but that was a great message to end on. I could throw another topic at you if you like, but uh, happy to leave it there. Yeah, I think that's a, I think a really good call. I'd like to thank everyone who uh, joined today and for your great questions and for the good discussion. Uh, until next time, thank you and uh, see you guys around. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon.